Okay, I think we're live. Awesome. Welcome to another live stream of Bubble Pins. Uh, so this week we're gonna be focusing on procedural animation. Uh, mostly powered by, most of them is powered by math. Uh, we will be exploring different ways of creating different kind of animation. Like, let me just bring that window back up. Like this, um, taking a character animation and defining the motion path of the character using uh, mathematical formulas and different ways uh, to manipulate the motion path. So we'll, we're going to be exploring different motion paths like uh, uh, the tornado motion and the sine wave and uh, the square wave, which I haven't figured a way to apply that square wave to an, um, an application for that yet, but that's in the works. Today, I'm going to go over like a brief overview of all the examples I've prepared so far so you can have an idea of the topics to come over the next few weeks. So this is something that I did with... I'm just going to pull it up. Just give me one second. So this is something I did with the Vellum series for the procedural, uh, procedural modeling techniques Vellum series, and that seemed really to, to go really well. That was actually by accident. The first episode or the part two of the Vellum modeling uh, procedural modeling series, I had went over all the different examples I had prepared. Um, I'm trying to get a screenshot. If I had a screenshot of the the node setup of the node network setup I had like all these different types of examples one with the flapping wings the ice cream uh, the clothing and the garbage can and there was a lot more to that and there's like a windy poster one too and the flat tires so I had a lot of different applications for the villain modeling and I had briefly shown that all over this part two episode accidentally because that wasn't the intended uh that wasn't intended for part two but i had went over i had too many examples and it went over time <laughs> but then i figured that's actually a really nice idea to go over all the examples i have to let you get an idea of what's to come and sort of start your brain juice running so I'm going to ride on that and I'm going to do the same thing and show you some of the examples that I've prepared ahead of time for the procedural animation series now. Now, for before we begin, I just want to welcome uh, Vision Vid, Vidsendak. So welcome. Welcome to the membership. Um, okay. And let me show you what I have in store for now. So one of the things I love about this, well, okay, let me actually start from the beginning first. It all started when I uh, went exploring into Blender Boids. So Blender Boids is like a particle system inside Blender, which is a, a free, open source, free 3D application. Very similar to Houdini. It can do almost anything, but Houdini is on a, a very procedural. So Houdini is a much more procedural workflow compared to Blender. Anyways, I went on and explored the Boyd's particle system in Blender. And it can do a lot of stuff very easily with a few clicks. But I wanted to compare the difference between Blender and Houdini and what it can do. So I started recreating what I did in Blender, but inside Houdini. And then I figured out the particle system inside Houdini is much more uh, complex and it's much, it can do a lot more because of the complexity. One of the things is that, uh, so all these examples you see here are done in Blender. But the tornado example that I'm just going to load up. Okay, here it is. So this is a very, very simple tornado motion. This tornado motion 
as simple as it may be, it's actually not very hard to do too. Um, this motion can then be converted into a volume velocity, or some people may recognize it when I say vector field. And this is super useful because the vec a vector field can tell a simulation where to go. Like it's sort of like a direction. Um, it's really like a backseat driver. You have like a backseat driver always telling the particles or always telling your pyro sim, go left, go right, go, go down, go, go up. Or, or it's like a vector field with a, a, a direction, instruction for every single voxel, telling the simulation to go every point of time in every frame. This is incredibly useful. And I will show you how you can use this particle system in Houdini, convert this tornado into a volume velocity or a vector field. And then, okay, this is not the one that I actually converted. I have a few different ones, but the one that I actually did convert into a velo uh, velocity volume is this one. A uh, highly modified. It's actually the same one that you. I just. I was just playing. The, it's the same tornado effect, but it's highly modified to have a different look and feel. I take this and I convert it into a volume velocity. Now this volume velocity is then fed into another simulation, and this is stuff that we're going to explore. So this procedural animation not only goes as far as um, animating, creating animations, it's also powering simulations, which is very, very flexible and useful. So let me show you the pyro, that's this one. So I took that volume velocity and I'm powering this pyro simulation. Just give it one second to load. Okay. It's sourcing it all in through. Now, let me show you the pyro with the particles. That's probably will give you a better idea. Let me turn on the velocity markers. I think it's on. Okay, here it is. Okay, there is the velocity. Now, I've reduced the number of particles so you can actually see the the volume. Otherwise, if I don't reduce it, if I ignore this, there's like a ton of it. So all each particle here is, now this is the particles before it's converted into a vol volume velocity. But I'm taking this particle system and converting it into a volume velocity, which is a, a vector field that is driving uh, which is the sole driving force in the pyro simulation. In order to simplify the example, the only force acting on it is this volume velocity. So this is just one of the applications of it. So that's just one application of this procedural um, technique. There's also this, um, actually I should finish. Let's do this too. There's one more thing I want to show you before I uh, show you the next example. Is that I noticed in Blender Boyds that you could very easily instantiate or um, instantiate like copy a character animation and stick it onto each particle for example these bees so there's th these bees have these flapping wings and each particle this is actually a particle system with each particle has a bee um, copied onto it now and it looks like a huge swarm chasing this poor dude here so cop instancing an object instancing another object onto um onto the particle system 
That that was something I didn't know how to do in Houdini. I actually had to look that up. So it wasn't as um, intuitive compared to Blender. Blender has actually like a parameter, so you can just specify the object that you want to instance for every single particle. So that was like super simple. Let me just close this. In Houdini, it's actually a little bit... It's not as intuitive, but it's not complicated either. So, okay, let's ignore all this. There's three of these here. So this is the particle system. This is our pop net. And I have three different ways of creating the tornado. So that was that's an example to be explored in the next few weeks in more detail. Now, there is... Th your pop source goes over here, whatever your pop force is over here. So we can just ignore this for one second. And what I want to focus on is show you how to instance another object onto each particle to get that same bee swarming effect or you whatever you want to instance, a character that you want to place. There's something called a pop instance. And that's just this thing. You can just drop it down and you can tell Houdini what particle that you want to instance. Let me just grab my handy application. Uh, R. Okay. There we go. Okay, so this um, this parameter here will tell us uh, you can fill in whatever object you want to instance here. So here I have fed in a packed geometry. It doesn't have to be a packed geometry, but it is a good idea to feed in a packed geometry just because that will reduce the, it will optimize the memory usage. So let's, okay, let me get rid of all this. Uh, let's go to, let's go back over there. Here, so I'm instancing this object here. This squid or what is it? Squab. <laughs> Let's switch it over to the rubber toy because that's my favorite test geometry. So I want to instance this, um, copy this rubber toy onto every single particle that you see over here. Onto our tornado, let me turn off the, okay. Onto this tornado effect here. So we have the rubber toy. Now I throw in a packed, just to pack it so that it's more optimized. The switch is only here so I can easily switch between the squab and um, the rubber toy, whichever one I want to instance. So this is what we're copying over. So let's out instance pack geometry. Now let's go back into inside the pop net. And it's popped instance. So that's what I have pointing here, out instance pack geometry. So let's play it again. You can start, you can actually see it on the viewport. Really, really tiny. Because the uniform scale over here is, um, this uniform scale is at 0 0.01. So it's super, super tiny right now. Okay, and the viewport starts to slow down. So this is one of the reasons why you really need that pot packed geometry. Let me zoom in. Now, they don't have much shaders on it. So that's, I have had instances where um, I had too many particles and you start to see cubes in place in, in place of your geometry within the simulation. That's when you know you're running out of RAM and Houdini's viewport is starting to optimize it because it's gonna, it's saying like, okay, you're I, I you're running out of RAM and you're gonna crash soon. So it's gonna opt automatically optimize your viewport in in substitute of each rubber toy or whatever geometry you have plugged in. It will substitute a cube. So when you start to see a bunch of cubes going on, you know that you're running out of RAM. Know that you have to have this pop instance plugged in here in order to get it 
to come back up. Like, what I mean is that in order to render your uh, particles geometry inside Houdini, you always need a DOP import. So I have my DOP import, and you can see, now this DOP import, let's see, I have this, uh, the pop net plugged in, which is this guy in there. I also have this fetch. So I'm fetching geometry from uh, DOP network. So I'm just fetching all the geometry. But I we don't see the rubber toy, do we? I mean, l let me double check. I, ha I have it turned on, so it is on. So w we're fetching... We're fetching all the geometry from the DOP network, but we don't see, there's no rubber toy. So that's something you need to know. You, uh, you fetch all the geometry, it's actually there. Go pop instance, and it comes up. So you do need a corresponding instance node pair. Now you can start to see the cubes, because I'm, I'm starting to run out of memory. You can start to see the cubes in replace of the rubber toy. I know it's rubber toys because they're blue. So if I zoom in, there's a swarm of rubber toys. But when I start to zoom out, you can see these cubes in that's, that's starting to show up over here. All these cubes. It, it's saying that the, the Houdini viewport is starting to optimize itself because I'm probably running it around. There's too many particles. Okay. So that's how you instance stuff in, in the particle network. That's something that was new to me because I've actually, to my surprise, even to me, that I've actually never done a particle tutorial particles tutorial in Houdini but I've actually used it quite a bit just to power different simulations for the of mainly for vol creating diff different um, velocity vectors of uh, different vector fields um, to power different simulations so this is a perfect opportunity to go over all this so that's just the tornado so I have like, so that's something we're going to go over in the next few weeks, different ways of creating the tornado without my custom force. So there will be some vex along the way, but this is super simple. I will want to show you this. Um, here. We can actually do this uh, from scratch really quickly, just to show you that how simple it is. You start off something simple. Let's start off with the torus. So this is going to be our in inmitter. And let's scatter some particles all over it. So we're going to be emitting from these particles. And then let's drop down a pop net. So just type in pop net. Boom. You get like a working particle simulation inside Houdini. Let's play it. It doesn't do anything just because there's no there's no force that's acting on it right now um so that's what we have to add so let's get rid of this merge because i'm only going to have one branch now uh for simplicity's sake let's let's drop down a pop force because that's the one i used Now let's play it. Nothing. We we actually have to turn right now the force is zero. So we do have to increase it. Still nothing. Like, okay, uh one second. Here, that's what I changed. To this. Change that to one. It's actually not doing much you will find that once you drop this that is one thing that i found funny with the pop force on first time use it might be a little 
difficult to get a hang of because it, you drop it down you your first instance is to play the simulation but it nothing happens until you turn up the amplitude oh wait sorry i think i forgot to pop source scatter Th this is one another thing i did forget one thing though here for the pop source uh emission type scatter all points so we want actually want to grab all the points first there we go then you can see it come up okay so let's do that one more time Let let's get rid of this one more time and then just play nothing happens first i forgot to use all the points so this is one thing that i did forget to do this here is important to configure this will feed this will grab all the points from your emitter and it will start the pop source is what feeds into the particle simulation it's what you grab to feed into the particle simulation. What do you want to grab? You want to grab all the points that we fed from where? From the first context geometry. And that is, that is this thing right here. That's this, that's this line that you see connected here. That's the first context, uh, uh, first context geometry this is the second one this is the third one hopefully you can see the tooltip fourth one gory hello okay now let's play it nothing happens let's drop down the pop force again let's try that again <laughs> Now let's let's do what I did again. Uh, repeat the same steps again, and add. Um, so once you drop that down and you play it, nothing happens because there's no force acting on it. Everything's zero. So let's do that again. So let's increase this to one. So it's just pushing everything up. Play it. Goes up. Awesome. Because we're actually grabbing stuff from from this pop source now. Okay. Now, if you want to grab noise, so everything you see down here in everything you see over here, this is actually the noise tab. Uh, actually, let me this tab right here every all the parameters that you see here is uh, configures the noise so it adds noise to the existing force which the existing force is only pushing it up because we added a one over here but there's no noise you can see that when we play it that is just going up. So we want to add a bit of noise. Let's turn it up. Let's go to amplitude and turn it up by one. See what happens. Now we're getting a bit of zigzag. It's not completely straight now. So this, let's turn it, let's turn it higher so it's more exaggerated. Okay, now we get more something way more interesting. Now that's not what I wanted to show you. I've actually kept this at zero for most of my examples. Um, for most of my procedural examples that you see over here. I've kept this at zero, kept the noise at zero. And instead, we're gonna explore this vex here. Now I know I haven't had, at, I don't think I've ever had actually a vex tutorial, like a beginner tutorial, which I really wanted to build up on. Just because I have these long explanations, I 
don't know how to approach explaining VEX because it's a rather complex topic. But Houdini has a very handy drop down here, and it already has stuff implemented for you, snippets of code that you can actually use. So the one that I'm going to be using is this orbit, the origin. Which we're gonna just click it and it inputs all this this snippet of code already implemented for you. And then let's just play it. Let's just see what it does. You can see that it already has that tornado spinning effect. Except it, it's it doesn't really look like a tornado, right? It, it's just spinning in place. It's not growing up. We've actually lost the force that it's going up like here. Even if you increase it, I believe it won't go up. It's just going faster though. So let's just 0 0.1 because I want it to slow down. No, that's too slow. Okay, there it goes. So what this already gets us halfway through. Now I want it to look more like a tornado. So let's make it go up. Now the force is actually a vector. I'm not going to go over too deep. Like I'm not going to explain what this does. What I will do is I'm just going to overwrite it. And I'm going to go, let's make it. So force, this force is a vector. Every vector has an x, y, z. Meaning that this guy has stuff like x, y, z. So this, it actually has an x component, y component, and z component composed of this force vector. What we're going to change, we're going to overwrite is the first component. Now, arrays are always zero based. So force equals x that's always zero is this zero over here means it's the first component so it's always zero base you we have to get used to this zero is the first component style zero based writing style because that's in every single programming language so what we want is to push it up we want the y because we know that the y axis in Houdini pushes stuff up. It's the up direction. So this is what we want. Now let's just remove all that. And instead of the y, because y is not anything, we haven't defined y yet. Let's just go with 0 0.2. Just give it a value. Now let's play it. Okay, now we get something. And it's, if we look carefully, there's too many particles. We can't really see. But it's actually in a spiral motion going up. So it's simple as that to get that tornado effect. The basic tornado motion effect. So that's all it is. Now I take this. In order to get this look though. In order to get this one second. In order to get this look, I've significantly modified uh, that tornado, uh, that tornado force. So well, let's take a look at the pop net that I had prepared for this. Now this is the original one without any extra. There's no extra force other than the up force. That this looks, this should look super familiar to you. This is exactly what we had that I shown you. But the one that's playing over here in the viewport is this middle one. Ah, there's a lot more going on here. There's like, um, I took, I took this simple motion, the simple twirling motion, and I've added a lot of extra forces on it. But it's actually, since we started with something simple, Adding extra forces on it will seem a lot, it's actually a lot simpler step by step. And that's what I mean by step by step, like concept by concept. And that's how I, I approach my explanations. 
Uh, there's also another way. So this this is this orange part is. Um, so there's three different ways I do it. This is the using cross products to mainly figure out where is the turn, how far to turn it, in order to get the cyclonic uh, cyclonic motion of the tornado. There is another way, completely different, is that it uses an exponential formula. And this is a formula um, that tells it where to go based on position. Uh, this is a lot easier to implement. Let's actually play it. Sorry, my viewport's starting to slow down. Let me go back to frame one. Switch this over to this pop force now. Let me play it. It'll give you a very similar motion. It's a little slow. Let me zoom in. Oh, I know why it's slow. It's because of the particles. Let me disable this. Uh, it's because I'm, I'm instancing the, the rubber toy on every single particle. So it, it's slowing it down significantly. Let's turn it off because we don't need it right now. Look at this. Let's play it again. Okay, that's significantly faster. So this uses the exponential formula in order to create this tornado motion. This is a lot easier to implement if you're doing it by scratch. If you're not relying on the Houdini um, ready-made snippets of code that they already provide for you, this is significantly easier to implement from scratch. However, I find that this is a little harder to manipulate. For example, this one here. Okay, let me stop this. This one here, I have significantly modified in order to get a to manipulate torn the tornado into a completely different look. It's a lot easier to manipulate afterwards. Well, that's one thing that we will explore. But the pop, um, this particle instancing is super handy. Not only by instancing the rubber toys, which I've been doing quite a lot. Um, there is another one that I want to show you. Oh, you can't really make it, I guess. Make it out. This is here, is done in... This is a swarm of rubber toys, which is a, the flocking. It uses the Houdini uh, particle flocking force. And it has the rubber toys m f moving in a flock, uh, using a flocking algorithm. Let me get my windows back up. Let me pause this. Okay. So let's go back to that one that we had started. Pop. There's actually a pop flock. Or let's see, what's it called? Flock. Pop, pop, flock. This is, with this particle effect, will get you something similar to what you saw to this, this flocking effect over here, which is super fun to play with. It'll look much more better once you have like birds there instead of these rubber toys. But it's super fun to play with. Now, right now, there's the center force there. Attraction. Okay, let's actually just play it. So they're all attracted to the middle right now. What you can add is like... Uh, number of centers, internal force, void. You can add um, a pop goal.
interact. Uh, you can make the center actually move. Force, ignore mass. I can't. There should be a pop. There should be a goal force here somewhere. I can't remember how it was done in that one. Let me see if I can bring it up. Pop, pop, nut. Okay, and then let's move on while I have that loaded up. So I do have, I still have the hit file that uh, I used to create this uh, flock of rubber toys. So that's just open it up. Give a few minutes to launch. Uh, let's move on and I'll round, I'll come back to that. Let's see. So another thing is the sine wave that I really wanted to show you is this bouncing sine wave. The sine wave by itself is not very interesting. Well, okay, this is already a modified sine wave. Um, there are different ways where you can modify it. So the, originally, it looks like this. Let me just... Remove all the fancy stuff that I threw into it, and then we get the sine wave. Goes up and down, up and down. And this repetitive up and down motion has so many applications. Because I use this up and down motion, and I turn it my jumping character animation and give it a bit more life. For example, the character animation here. It doesn't look like he's doing much, right? It looks like he's doing stretches. It doesn't look like he's jumping. But after you take the motion path of this sine wave, modify it, I mean add a bit of uh add a bit of love to it, add a bit of special sauce. And you add that character animation onto here with a modified version of the sine wave, you'll get something like this. Now this still needs work, right? It, it looks like he's a frog jumping. But at, it's getting better. So you can see that the sine wave is modified, that it doesn't go down anymore. And every single time it wants, the sine wave goes down. I've actually flipped it over to make the sine wave go up. So he's only jumping upwards. He's never like going overshooting downwards. And this is something that I wanted to show you here, the overshoot. The overshoot is what helps sells the look. So here he, he looks like a frog jumping up just because when he lands, he's instantly bouncing back up. So that is the part that isn't as uh, realistic because when you land, when you actually jump and you land on the floor, the impact will take a few. The floor is going to absorb your impact and it's going to take a few minutes or, or not a few minutes. It's going to take a moment for you to launch back up and jump back upwards. That pausing effect actually was a lot more complicated than I thought. But I managed to figure out how to do it with the sine wave to modify the sine wave in order to get that pausing effect. And then I came up with this. So it goes down and it holds it there for a second. Goes up. Holds it. it there is a bit of overshoot. And the overshoot will help sell the jump look. Afterwards, when I place this character um, jumping animation into an RBD destruction scene, 
which is something I'm just launching a video just one second which is something I apply here So he's jumping up and down. Jumping down. Up, down. Onto uh, an RBD fractured ground. Now there's one more crack here because there's one more jump. But I, had actually, uh, I accidentally trimmed um, the character jump animation. So he's only standing still here. There's actually one more jump too. After this. There's one more jump. And that's why he, this ground bursts over here. So the render was, um, this, this render was done very quickly. I will fix that a little later. Okay. So this is what preps. So that's one of the applications of this. Hopefully you can start to see we, the mount, uh, how flexible, how useful this sine wave is. Now let me play the jumping animation with this. He jumps, he holds. Oh, actually I have a, I did a flip book. So this is much easier to play back. Cause the other one's taking too long to, to play. He jumps, he holds down, he jumps and there's a pause. And this is all done with the sine wave. So pausing the sine wave, pause and sliding the sine wave is actually really easy, but pause and holding it in place right here is, is a little tricky. And I'll show you what I mean. Uh, this pause and hold. Okay. Now, Pause and hold, but it's still it's still moving. It's just holding it in place right there. If I actually place the character on here, it would slide down. And I didn't really like that effect. I wanted it to overshoot downwards a bit and not slide forward. This is actually really easy. This sliding forward is super easy. There's not much to it. Let me show you. It's still the same old sine wave. I mean, I I have more fancy stuff all over it. There's all this fancy, um, uh, the absolute value of the sine wave. This is to flip it so that it doesn't go downwards anymore. So this is not too bad. Uh, let me grab one more thing. I had actually did a very, very detailed blog post on how to manipulate sine wave motion. So this is one of the things. This is the sine wave by itself. That's what it looks over here. Up and down. Uh, it's really small. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Not much to it. But we can, after manipulating it, let me see if I can find the absolute value here absolute value here so here you uh, let me make it larger this absolute let's ignore this 4.5 this is just making it larger the abs which is taking the sine wave here and it's applying it to the abs which is only returning the positive value and then this is what is resulted dotted one is the 4.5. It's this one down here. Now you can see there's another um, there's another one, a smaller wave that's bouncing here. This is the one with the ABS without the 4.5. It's the same one. I just wanted to show you what the 4.5 was doing in this example. But without, let's not care about the 4.5 because that's just making it go higher. If we only 
uh, concentrate on. If we only concentrate on this part here, this ABS is flipping it so that it's only going in the positive direction. If we didn't have the ABS here, this ABS, if we didn't have this ABS, if we didn't have the ABS there, it would go up and down, up and down, up and down like a normal sine wave so that's how with different ways we can manipulate the sine wave to do very nice um very uh special effects let's take a look here uh soto monte uh pretty new to udini been enjoying your tubes by the way the show the slow mode in the live chat is a bit too slow in my opinion but anyway nice to have a chat oh did i actually have to turn on Oh, I do. So the moon is turned on. Uh, I have to pay more attention to the options when I create the streams. I, I apologize for that. I I will take a note for the next time just because I can't change it. Let me see. I don't think I can change it anymore. Yeah, I don't have that option to change it. Oh, stream settings. I, uh, yeah, I can't change it anymore. So once it's cr once the stream is created... It's um, it's set in stone, <laughs> but I can always I'll remember that for the next one. But anyway, nice to catch you on your stream. Do you usually stream? I do. I try to. Well, I don't have a routine schedule though. <laughs> I try to do one every so often. It's the amount of time it takes to prepare for the streams. That is something I can't predict because each topic is. I have a wide range of topics, and each topic is, is completely different. Sometimes I would go on simulation, sometimes I would go on to, like, this week, it, it's procedural animation, and it this one was actually a lot, took a lot longer to prepare, so, yeah, I don't really have a routine schedule. <laughs> I try to have one every so often. I do apologize for that. It's 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 hard to get a routine schedule. Maybe w one day when it, the channel gets larger, I can get more help or something. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but anyway, you can pay. Um, I don't have much of an announcement. Just going to my channel. Oh, that is slow. <laughs> but if you go to the community tab of the channel over here, I do usually post an announcement. But this was just one day ago. Like, it's not much, but at least it's it's something. Just because I, I can't uh, go any... I, I can't prolong it any further. <laughs> By the time I know I... Okay, I got enough examples. I can go ahead with the stream. I see, I see. I uh, I help reduce streams, so I get that the prep time is more than people realize. Yeah, th thanks. Thank you. Thank you for understanding. I It's something I've been working on. Maybe I can get, like, a more routine thing going. I have, I have been trying, but... Yeah... Oh, uh, let's see. So this is like it sliding. Hmm. Independence Day is awesome. I got the announcement. <laughs> Good. Awesome. I wish there was a better way to uh, notify people. Because I know that a lot of people don't even know that the community tab exists on the on the platform. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. Let's move on a bit. Oh, right. I wanted to show you the particles of the rubber toy flock. My Houdini finally opened. <laughs> Where are you? Okay, there it is.
Hopefully this is the right file. Okay, awesome. Let's... Oops. Uh, so to Monte. Oh, cool. I'll try to get my eyes peeled for those community poses. Awesome. Thanks. I'll try to actually, um, post it on my Twitter next time, actually. I gotta remember doing that. I have these random places where I post stuff. <laughs> just to, just to let you know that I post whatever I'm developing on, like, some of the snippets of things, the scenes that I'm developing on, onto my Twitter, so you see random things. And then, um... Because Twitter is very casual. I can just post something really rough. It's not fine-tuned. It's just like a flipbook animation. So if you want to know what's... Or get a teaser or a hint of the upcoming videos, Twitter, my Twitter is the best place to catch it on. And then my Instagram has more like, oh, this looks pretty. Okay, I'll post it on Instagram. <laughs> uh, as for the community post, I have mostly membership stuff because if you join the bubble pins membership you get the hip file uh special exclusive content mm -hmm. and that all goes into the community tab just because that's the only place where you can send stuff to the members to for members only and then there are you can these are public messages so there are like other stuff that you can different channels that it goes through uh, as for these announcements, so important stuff goes to the community tab, basically. I gotta stop before I start blabbing on. <laughs> now, let's go back to that, uh, remember this dude. Let me zoom out. Okay, here it goes. There's the flock. There's a pop flock. Let me get my grid, because I don't know my <laughs> orientation right now. Okay, this is it. There you go. It's going back and forth. So this is the pop flock. This is super fun to play with. Now, what I wanted to show you was uh, the goal, which I couldn't remember how I did it. <laughs> That's Houdini for you. There's so many options, so many parameters. So this is um, this is the pop source. So we all know what that's doing. It's feeding in whatever we have as an emitter. And what do I have as an emitter is just a s sphere with um, uh, a, a bunch of points. Like this is the emitter. Okay, let's go back in. That's pop instance. We're instancing the rubber toy. So every particle is down a rubber toy. And there's the fun thing is the pop flock. Uh, and then pop drag. Oh, I used a pop attract. So this is the sine wave again. I use the sine wave a lot. So you can see here, let me let me do this. So this is how I make it go back and forth, but still maintain that flocking uh uh flocking force. I use the sine wave here in order to make it go attract back and forth so to pull it there's like an invisible force that pulls all this flock of rubber toys back and forth because the sine wave has this very special feature of moving up and down this very special feature of going up down up down this is what is making uh, I'm trying to get this side by side. Doing this left. And then slowly going to the right. And then left. So that's why we're getting this up down motion. Now we're getting this motion. But we're not moving forward. So that's how it stays. Um, back and forth on the same line. Like it's always. This is actually the ground. So it's always uh, very close to the ground. So we're only affecting, we're only taking the Y, but we're not taking the X. Now, if our um, X value was zero, what would this graph look like? It would just go up, down, up, down, right here. It would never move. It would just be, sorry, those, those, I keep forgetting to delete these overlays. 
x was zero there. If it's x was zero, it would just go up, down, up, down. We wouldn't get this motion if x was zero. Um, so that's how I did the pop flock, this flocking. No, <laughs> this flocking is using the pop attract in place of the goal. So there is no goal. The goal, what I was thinking of the goal, it was a blender thing. So that's how I, yeah, things get a little messed up in your head when you're doing too much of this. Uh, so th this is how useful. What I really wanted to show you is that how useful this sine wave is. And we're going to be exploring more on how to manipulate the sine wave. throughout the different examples I've set up. This, so this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's actually a lot more. Um, I'm working on the basic concepts for each example. So what I've been known to do is that we have this tornado. I'm going to use the tornado as an example. We have this tornado. And we have these particles here. But how is it created? And... Um, how would I explain this? So I have this basic concept, which is a, a smaller concept. So you can easily grasp, have your mind grasp on it. And then I add a little bit more to that concept, which would be basic concept number two, and then build up on it until we get to this. So I've been known, I called it the build up. <laughs> it's like a build up of concepts. I can actually show you. This is a bit more rough. Oh, the size is a little different. Okay, let's. Okay. So, this is what I've been working on. So, there's more, all these basic concepts which will explain the sine wave. This will explain the modulus in order to get, um, explain the square wave. So I do have a square wave that I haven't shown you. Oh, this is an alternating square wave. Uh, I think I have the wrong one. This is the one I wanted to show you. Let me turn it darker. Okay. So that's another wave that we will explore. But I haven't found an application to apply this to. Like, I don't, I don't know how this can be useful. So I'm working on that. And I'm still working on the basic concepts to explain each example. So that's still in the works. Oh, there is another example I have. Let me get the grid back. Okay, you see this little dot here? Let me put the trail. Oh, the trail's not long enough. Uh, right. My parameters. Okay, maybe you can make this out. It's the outline of the rubber toy. <laughs> so this is one of the things that we can use to have, this was me having fun with the particle. And using, I believe this wasn't, it's not very sine wave related but i was having fun with it it was like i wonder if it would be fun to have this to draw this rubber toy repeatedly here 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 like i have to increase the number of frames though let's 
do with this. One, two. I believe it should move forward. And then draw another one. I guess not. I was working on that. To draw multiple rubber toys. Lining them up like rubber ducks. That would have been fun. But that's still in the works. Uh, there is one more thing I want to show you. Is this... Hopefully, this procedural animation uh, concept or this, this, this topic technique will build up to... So this is the rig. There's the jump. So this is just the rig without the bone deform. This is the character right here. Let me turn it all back. Now... Watch when we we can apply these techniques because now we know how to manipulate the point and the motion path. So the key is to get this motion path. This motion path is to get this motion. Now we know how to manipulate this. Or, or soon we will know how to manipulate this. We can apply this to rag dolls, which will be way more exciting. But you have to start off with the basic concept somewhere first. You have to start slow and then build up onto it. And once we understand how to manipulate these uh, 3D type of motions, we can start to apply it to rag dolls, which is something I'm still working on. So this is a topic to come in the later end of the, the procedural animation series. Just give it one second to load. This is a character. So this creature, this green creature like animation was something um, I got from Reillusion uh, or, or uh, something created from iClone. Uh, and I've noticed that the real illusion rigs, in order to convert them into Houdini, like they're not very compatible. <laughs> it's not as great for compatibility. It does uh, have a little, uh, some of its quirks to, to be aware of. And I actually want to show you, if only this thing would finish loading. Oh, it's because I have too many frames. Let me reduce it back. It's because it's loading all the frames. One second. Uh, let's do 75. Okay, that's much faster. So it does have to process all the frames. Which is one of the downsides of working with ragdolls. One of the new features in Houdini 19 is the ragdoll constraint, which is so awesome to play with. So I turned this jumping animation. Now you see the two cubes over here. Let's ignore the cubes for a second. Let's we oh, let's keep that. Collision geometry. Okay, there it goes. Now you can see the arm flapping all over the place. I'm still working on that part. That that arm flapping is being controlled by a constraint that I have. That's this line right here. That's this line right here. This line right here is... Uh, let me change the color. Uh, that line right here is being controlled, it's pulling it. It's pulling this ragdoll rig, this real illusion, uh, this Einklone rig. It's actually the same jumping animation. I wanted to add a bit more, enhance the jumping animation with a bit more life to add some secondary motion using the, n the new Houdini 19 ragdoll constraints. But it's still in the work. So it looks like he's w waving his arm around. 
Now let's me apply this rig back to the bone deform so we can actually see the skinning of the character. <laughs> so it looks like his arm wants to come loose. So it's still in the works. But I at least got the constraint working. So what it is, it's this constraint. So I have to, these two cubes, these two cubes are following the sine wave and it's going up and down. It's actually following the same motion of the jump, the same jumping motion as the character that we applied using this, this sine wave over here, like this motion trail. It's using this motion trail, but I'm putting the box on it and then attaching a ragdoll constraint. So that's what this white line over here is. It, it's attaching, it's pull, this box here is pulling this arm toward this direction. The idea behind this was to have this character, um, this character's arm both arms, eventually I have both arms will be, uh, will have a ragdoll constraint attached to it. And when he goes up to have its arms raise upwards, and then when he falls down to have the whole body, f to have some of the limbs go down a little bit more downward. So it has a bit more cohesion with the jump motion. So we can add more secondary motion like that. So that's, in, that's the goal. I still have a long way to go. Because right now he looks like he's waving his arm around. Which actually can be um uh something just clicked in my mind. Which can be like something he's prepping to to punch something. <laughs> but that was not the intention. <laughs> it's very spongy too. I think I have the sponge parameter turned up too much. So I have to tweak the ragdoll constraints parameters a bit more so it doesn't look like his left uh his right arm is falling apart that's still in the works but that's to come and that's only po you, you you're not into character animation but that's okay because i still have something for you too now this is the bouncing motion we don't really need a character we can have uh attach a sphere on it now where's my sphere? Okay, motion path. Now this ball. Let's attach. I can't find my sphere right now, so I'm just gonna create it right right on the bat. Oops. So we can have a sphere. Turn that off. Okay, and then transform using that. Okay, I wanna look. Okay, there's our velocity on our sphere. It's boing, oh, boing, boing. Now let's feed this into a pyro. So I want it to create smoke whenever it crashes down onto the ground. Create smoke. Let's see, pyro, pyro burst. Oh, there's our sphere, sphere. Okay, here we have, there we go. Every single time it crashes, impacts onto the ground, it emits um, a burst of smoke. But, and because the the sphere is going forward. The smoke is inheriting some of the velocity going forward as well. You can see there's our emission. It only exists the ground. This will allow us to create procedural pyro effects without let's see what else i hope i didn't miss anything oh and this is the ground cracking so this one i don't know if i've shown you i think i did 
but let me show it again, just in case. As for the ground cracking, this is an RBD simulation. Which is this setup. Let's see, so all of this here is to set up the mission. So the blue block here, this blue, um, the blue block here is the RBD. And this is what's powering is the pink block, which is the character animation. So that's why you see here only the character animation. And then this whole part is the mission for the, or the fracturing for the RBD simulation. Now I had to cut it into two pieces. Uh, let's see. Tell ya boy, what? <laughs> I just want to mention that every time you start a simulation or something heavy calculating on your side, I'm losing connection. <laughs> I am so sorry. That must, there must be something on my side. I have to wait. Let me close a few applications. I have way too much stuff open. Uh, let me see. What else can I close? Let me close. I've actually increased the number, uh, the amount of RAM on my computer too. It must be my video RAM. Okay, see if that helps. I closed a bunch of applications. Uh, here we start off with a ground. So this is where he's gonna land on. But as you can see, there's actually a hole. This is actually split into two pieces. One is where he will land because I don't really want to fracture. No, let me get a top-down view. I don't want to fracture this part. Uh, let me see. How can I? Okay, let me just make it right here. No, that's just confusing. <laughs> uh, how can I draw this? Okay. The line. No, that's, that's terrible. Okay. You know what? This is the part I don't want to fracture. This is the part where I do want to fracture. I don't know if that makes sense. So the outer part here doesn't need fracturing because it's just a waste of CPU cycles, because he's never going to land there. It, so we want to minimize the number of fractures on the outer, um, on the outside. And we want to focus most of the fracturing where the character will actually land. So you can see that it's starting to have a little pad over here, because I've reduced the number of uh, frames here. Let me increase this back. The way I have it fractured is using a solver sop. So this is a very special solver that exists on the SOP level. It is used to remember things. And I'm actually remembering where his footsteps are. I had to cache it in order to speed this up a bit. So let me show you what it's actually remembering. The red is where I use an attribute transfer to transfer the footsteps where he, the foot is in contact with the ground. So the red spots is where he lands where he's ever going to come in contact. And you can see that the red doesn't disappear. And that's all thanks to this solver sop up here. To this guy over here. Now let's see what it looks like without the solver sop. So let's place this color like before the solver sop. And let's see what it looks like. You can see it turns red and it disappears. The red doesn't hold. It doesn't, it's not stored. It just goes away right after he loses contact with the ground. So that's what's so special about this solver stop. It can remember things. It is a little complicated though, the solver stop. I do have a tutorial on the solver stop. Uh... Okay, maybe I won't grab it because it's going to, lag the stream 
every single time I open something up. I'll post um I'll post a link in the description for the solver stop tutorial. And we'll go over it in the weeks to come when I explain this scene, when I explain this particular effect, the cracking, ground cracking effect. So I use all that to remember where he lands in order to optimize the fracturing of the scene. So I don't fracture unnecessary areas of the ground. I just want to show you what the ground looks like after it's fractured. It will take a second or maybe a minute to load. And what you should see is that most of the fracturing is focused on where the footsteps were. So it's all, mostly it's focused in the middle right here. And that's the areas where he, this uh, green dude is going to land. And the outer edge or the outer uh, areas has minimum amount of fracturing. It doesn't, it's not zero amount of fracturing, it's minimum because it does need to fracture. Like the fracturing needs to make sense. If you have something like this, you, you can't, well, you can, you can have it like just one piece. It's not gonna be great because you're gonna end up with a hole just here. Like it's nice to have a flow of fracturing. Hopefully that makes sense. It's like you can't have zero fracturing on the other outer end like you can but it won't look nice rbd connected this wasn't actually necessary this is rbd connected faces is used to delete the inner face which is really handy for making glass breaking glass shattering glass just because when you render glass if it's you're rendering the fractured piece of glass you actually see the fractured lines since uh, you have to throw on an, a transparent material onto the glass and this helps you get rid of all those lines which is another tutorial I did before but for this in this case it wasn't really necessary uh, and after you fracture it it'll, and after you have most of the tough work or hard work is done in the fracturing after you got that uh set up it's just a matter of hooking up the character animation as a collision geometry and plugging it straight into the rbd solver <clears throat> okay let me just load the cache since i have a cache this does load really really slow so you can see where the velocity is coming from. You see all the velocities bursting out. It's actually a very simple RBD simulation. The tough part is, again, it's only in the fracturing. Th just to optimize the scene. <laughs> oh, my Jojo. No problem. You can always watch the replay. It's it's no pressure. <laughs> Interesting. Is there any chance that you composite this stream in a real video shot example? Grab a video of my landmark and composite this Hulk jumps around it using the sim. That was the idea to get um, that jumping effect. We can make him jump in a circle. That would be interesting. <laughs> I am not noticing any issues with the stream when you are running the simulation. It's uh, most because you came in pretty late. Most of the, I think. Um, independence was having a lot of streaming issues because at the beginning i was cooking in real time most of this is is cached i didn't cache everything i cached some of it i didn't realize that the particle ones were slowing it down as well because the particles i was expecting to run smoother these the, the rbd here this was this is intense i knew at the beginning so this one is cached this is not cooking in real time. You can see the blue bar. It's not moving. <laughs> it is the, the, the particle ones, I'm guessing, was slowing it down, which was very unexpected. I didn't think the particles would slow it down. Like this stuff here, I didn't think this would slow it down. Apparently, I'm overestimating my computer.
uh, it is smooth for me too this time. Maybe it was on my side. Oh, I, I think it's because it's cached. I have caching on these simulations. On these simulations. Except for the pyro. So, oh, there it goes. It, it's starting to kick in. No, I didn't cache the pyro. I should have cached the pyro. This should slow it down. I don't mean to test the stream, but <laughs> I think this should everyone should be experiencing some slowdown. Because this is cooking in real time. Okay, I stopped it. Enough of that. Yeah, other than this. So I've been working on the basic concepts. That's almost done. And then the rag dolls is in the works. I can't wait until I get this rag dolls uh, working. Oh, this is terrible with the lag. The rag dolls. I hope, I wonder if side effects is going to optimize the <laughs> rag dolls because it really needs optimizing. <laughs> Every little parameter that I change causes it to recook. And it sometimes it's not even changing much. It's just changing one little thing. How long did it take you for the sim? Which sim? The Ragnar? I have so many. Still no issue on the stream. Oh, okay, that's good. That's good to know. It could be my internet. Maybe it's just the time, of, like the random hours. I don't know. I can't wait until I get this fixed. <laughs> It's clovering time. <laughs> that would be fun. Oh, I should make sound effects for that. Okay, that's about all the examples I had in store. So you can expect for the upcoming weeks to have more explanations on this. A deeper dive into each one in concept per concept build up for the solver over oh, the sop solver sop the particles were really quick actually like the tornado and on all the, these cooks really quickly on my computer without the stream like once once you're streaming it, it's a total different story like this was cooking super fast on my computer earlier those are the velocity markers. So let me turn it off. Turn it on. Looks fancy with the velocity markers. <laughs> like a bunch of fur moving. So these cook really quickly. The ones that cooked the l took the longest time to cook was the RBD cracking, where the ground cracking and the pyro. The pyro wasn't too bad. The pyro burst. That's where the... This ball, where it has that little burst of smoke, that actually was really quick when when I'm not streaming. Um, the pyro smoke tornado, like the vo vector... Vo um, the vector field driving the pyro, this took a while to cook. Just because I had a lot of particles. Like... What you see here is a reduced amount of particles. In order, um, here, let me ignore the reduction. Here, this is the actual number of particles. There's a lot of them, and this is only 75 frames. I was uh, cooking it with a thousand frames, <laughs> and it builds up like it grows. I think I had a life span of like 10 seconds or something for each particle. So. Over time, it would accumulate more and more important particles. I actually crashed Houdini a few times. And that's where I re started reducing the frame length. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> this was really... This has potential. Um, using particles, using the PopNet in Houdini to create vector fields. That has huge potentials. You can take the volume velocity and actually export it out of Houdini and apply it to different 3D applications. 
they'll accept any any other 3D application that will accept a, a vector field to power its own simulation. So I'm not sure if Blender will accept because Blender has its own volume, uh, its own pyro solver, uh, its own pyro simulation and all its particle stuff it has its own world of simulation. It may... Um, Oh, the best example is Unreal. Unreal will take a volume, velocity volume, or a vector field, as in this, and you can drive your game or your special effects in Unreal using these vector fields that you design inside Houdini. I believe there is a labs tool to help you with that. What is it called? It's on the tip of my tongue. It was one of those labs tools that side effects created just for Unreal. Unreal or something? Oh, I don't think they made it into build. It might still be in prototype. Ah, this one. Nigeria. This is for Unreal. This is the pi particle simulation uh, particle simulator name in Unreal. Although I've never actually used this, so I'm I'm not an Unreal guru. But this has potential, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I left my PC running for vellum cloth for three PCs, pieces of clothing, and after three hours, I reached the six use to optimize the scene before you start wasting money. Because I don't want, like, yeah, you can always throw more hardware onto your computer, but sometimes it, it might just be something simple as creating a proxy geometry. Maybe you just need a low, a low polygon uh, proxy geometry in substitute. And then afterwards, you can use that point deform trick and then transfer the data that you get from the vel may solve your problem. Just take another look at your simulation. Uh, let's see. I think that's all I have in store for today. Yep, that's rubber toy. Yeah, Ragdoll still in the works. Any questions? <laughs> Any things you want to see? Anything you like? Anything you don't like? Uh, before I end it off. Because I'm going to end off the stream. So this week was more like an overview of what's to come. So this is just the, I, uh, a lot of examples here and there. It's not a very deep dive into each example, which will come over the in the coming weeks which i'll have to explain it in more visual basic concepts build up cool awesome good luck thanks uh thanks for watching all right I guess that's all I have for today. So I want to thank everyone for joining me today. And another really long stream, even though it was very brief overview. I do. I'm still working on the time. Need to talk faster. But um, let's see your composite of this uh, scene in the upcoming weeks. Yeah, I can't wait. I will, I may have to um, render this scene out in Mantra just because I did try to, or even the flip books. Oh, that is one thing I forgot to mention. There has been a new update since Houdini 19 where SideFX had introduced this pyro bake volume. So you can actually render very 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 high quality pyro uh pyro scenes right out of the viewport this is so useful for me 
<laughs> just because it's so fast. The flip book animation is super, super fast. There are a few things that you need to be aware of. Now, um, one is that the voxel count or the, I'm trying to find it. So you have your pyro, you have your dot net. Let's go inside. You have this. You want to set this size, the size of your pyro, which is the voxel, the voxel, uh, voxel count or voxel size. This, the vision size of this smoke object. That's the size of, that's the resolution of the volume. The smaller this value is, the higher the resolution. So that's pyro for you. This will affect the quality of the render, no matter how you're rendering it up. Uh, using Flipbook or Redshift or Mantra or whatever. This, that affects it. So if you want a higher quality volume, make a smaller number for that. And then, and this py pyro bake volume over here, max resolution. So you want a, a larger number for this max resolution, which is the maximum resolution it'll handle. But you have to give it a higher resolution in the pyro simulation to begin with. So that's the second place that you need to be aware of. And the next thing is your viewport display settings. This is actually super important. Come over here where you have where the viewport have the most or, hovering over it. Press D on your keyboard. It'll bring up the display settings. And this is the settings that will configure for the viewport. Your viewport has to be able to handle the high resolution of of uh what you're feeding into it. And what are we feeding? We're feeding the pyro simulation out of it. If we're gonna feed in a high quality pyro, the viewport has to be able to handle it. Otherwise, it'll just trim it down and you're gonna get half the resolution or whatever. So one of the things is you need to be aware of, go to the geometry tab here, volume section, which is over here, and high quality. So you want volume quality, normal, Hi, and look at this. It turns instantly. Let me do that again. Uh, one second, let me. Okay, here, let me just, okay. Now, normal, hi. Now that instantly you see a more gradient drop. Normal. Hi. So you have a more room. This is it, your viewport is handling more, is displaying the higher quality of the volume. So that's one parameter. Next one is texture tab. Texture tab, uh, 3D texture section. I have to actually write this down. <laughs> I can't, you can't remember all this stuff. So this guy over here. Okay. In order to be able to handle the the huge amount of resolution, when when your uh, volume grows higher, and this over here, let me just draw a rectangle here, and then I turn this to full HDR. So those are the f things that I have uh, set up on my display port and. Don't forget the voxel size in the pyro here, this dimension division size, and the pyro big volume, the max resolution. So those are the things that you need to be aware of. If you want to render like me straight, if you want a high quality volume to render from uh, the flip book. Okay. Ah! Darn, that was that was a really n important thing. <laughs> How much did you get, Jojo? Did you did you get all the settings for the for the pyro? But that's okay. I will repeat it in the next one to come, in the next stream to come. Thanks for the stream. No questions here. Awesome, Soto Monta. Okay. Yeah, there's uh, my connection's wacky. 
It's very random. <laughs> uh, do, do, do. I've been trying to get like a PDF reference sheet out. Maybe this is a good time to do that for the settings. So there's so many settings. It's nice to have it on a sheet of paper if you want to print it out or you have it on a PDF and you can just look at it and just go through the settings and set it up. I think that'd be easier. So I can set that out for the members. Um, yeah, because I'm going to end up this end, end the stream. So if, if that part did get cut off, don't worry. It, I, it will come. I will repeat it in the next uh, few streams to come. So I, 